from this point in case I want to use that for publishing in case the YouTube doesn't work out so well. So welcome, uh, Peter Lucas Jones is our keynote here at the CC Summit 2023 in Mexico City. We're reporting from Mexico City. My name is Ken Bauer. Um, I'm a first timer at the summit here in Mexico City. Uh, I've been involved in CC quite a bit over the years, more in the open education space. And, and uh, Nate invited me to come and try out virtually connecting here from the CC Summit this year. And I'm really happy to be able to do that. Joined here by Taylor from uh, another staff member from CC. I'm not a staff member. Kate, Nate's over there. He's a staff member. And um, really what this is, is a hallway conversations. For those of you that don't know what virtually connecting is, it's something that was created many years ago by Mahali, um, Rebecca and, uh, and Autumn colleagues of ours that decided to create an environment so that people that could not go to conferences, especially people in the, in the global South who often had just, it was really difficult to make it up to conferences, especially in North America and Northern parts of the, of the hemispheres. And uh, you can get a live stream of the sessions and that's always interesting useful but what you miss in that is the hallway conversations that we so much love when we have the ability to make it to a conversation i had the privilege to uh interrupt peter at the end of a session yesterday and, and say hello and have a little bit of a conversation and we had some conversations as we were leaving the event yesterday so this is why we do this welcome um welcome donna as well i'm so glad that you made it i'm glad that you reached out and were able to join us and we also have interested listener i like to let people know you can not have your camera on if you don't like or, or preserve your privacy we are going out to youtube but i just like uh peter to do a little bit of introduction of, of why you're here at cc summit and uh what would you like to accomplish uh sharing with the people here uh kia ora. my name is peter lucas jones and i come from aotearoa new zealand i'm the ceo of te reo iridangi o te hiku o te ika, otherwise known as te hiku media um, we are one of 21 tribal broadcasters established um, in 1990. And uh, I come from Te Aupauri, Ngai Takoto, Ngāti Kahu and Te Rarawa. Those are the tribal groups that I affiliate to and the tribal groups that I am a member of. Um, currently, I am also the chair of our um, settlement trust, Te Runanga Nui o Te Aupauri. So um, the reason that I'm here is, first of all, because I was asked. And I want to express that it's an honor to be asked to attend this symposium and share a point of view, um, a unique point of view, uh, working in the context of tribal broadcasting. And the reason that we broadcast is to maintain our language as a method of communication and not just an academic experience. And over the last 30 years, we have uh, become prolific broad, um, uh, corpus gatherers. And as we uh, developed a vision for the future, we realized that we needed to enable our language to have a digital future. And having a digital future means that we were able to connect with our diaspora uh, with the content um, in different ways. So we are content creators, we are corpus gatherers, we are tribal broadcasters, we employ 20 people, um, and we uh, were founded um, because of the fight and the struggle of our elders and our people. Uh, to uh, have our language recognized. And then, of course, there was a series of legal uh, cases regarding um, the sale of state-owned broadcasting assets. And those had far-reaching consequences for Māori language and broadcasting. But the reason that we uh, uh, fought those fights was because um, we have a treaty in New Zealand and Te Tiriti o Waitangi is the founding document of Aotearoa New Zealand. And the treaty was signed between representatives of um, the British Crown who were the colonizing um, element in Aotearoa New Zealand and Rangatira from different tribal groups. Uh, the treaty was first signed 
uh, on the 6th of February in, in 1840. And then it was taken around other tribal areas where other rangatira signed the treaty. So it, to, to be, to, to be uh, straight to the point, the purpose of the treaty was to protect Maori rights and property, um, keep peace and order and establish a government. Uh, but uh, what we believe is that we have rights to spectrum. Um, and as indigenous people, we are in a process of having our rights to spectrum recognized. We as broadcasters, iwi broadcasters also recognize that that is our data pipeline. It is our data pipeline for uh, transmitting data, but also for receiving data. And that is the data that we tag and label uh, for uh, the curation uh, of our data sets and for our work in natural language processing. We were awarded a domestic data science project to teach computers how to speak Māori. Um, what we've achieved um, uh, are results uh, in the area of speech to text and also text to speech. Now, why are we here? Why am I here? I'm here because protecting data in a digital format uh, uh, confronts us with new challenges. When our data was all in analog format and in cassette tapes, VHS tapes and reel to reel and every other sort of format that can we can think about, it was in a box in a room under lock and key. But now our indigenous data is being harvested similarly to the way that our people were driven off our lands, um, the way that our people were made second-class citizens in our own homeland territories. And history has a strange way of repeating itself. And I know that legal tools are not the only way to protect our future, but they are one of the tools that I think that we have something to offer to the conversation, but also this symposium provides me with an opportunity to listen to how other people see these issues and how they are dealing with them. We have developed our own Kaitiaki Tanga data license. It's very much focused on values and principles. And those values and principles are the values and principles from our natural grouping of people, um, our, our, our tribal uh, knowledge informs the way that we have strategic relationships, partnerships, collaborations, or decide not to. And in so much as our data is concerned, we see it like land. And we wanna ensure that we are not landless in the new world that is fast developing. Unmuting myself because I was trying to keep the traffic noise down here. But thank you so much for sharing, Peter. Um, I, I'm usually, as the organizer, I'd, I'd like to reach out to people that have joined us, uh, either Donna or interested listener, if you'd like to share. Oh, and it's good to see AK, one of my colleagues, longtime colleagues of VC joining us as well. I don't know if Donna, if you have questions, I don't want to, I have lots, but I don't want to dominate the conversation in these. Um, yeah. Donna. I just typed it in actually. I, I'm I'm fascinated in your very last comment that your data is your land it, in a lot of and I, and it, that's so right. It's so profound, but I just never made one sentence that was so perfect as that. That's it, it's very true. So thank you for sharing that and and thank you for sharing your story and your experience. Really amazing. If I might just respond to that, um, we believe that our language springs from the life that our people live, the experiences, the landscapes, and we've stored our data um, in many different ways over the generations. 
and through song, through dance, but also through the landscape, because nomenclature is such an important feature of our history, naming every river, naming every tree, naming every plant in the forest, naming every beach, naming every waterway, all those sorts of things uh, provide an opportunity for our um, for our stories uh, to be linked with the physical features of our environment. And so our philosophical worldview uh, is something that we have taken into the work that we do, teaching computers how to speak our language. And we think about it carefully because we're mindful that as part of the white assimilation process, our parents and grandparents, many of them had the language um, beaten out of their mouths at school. And so we're mindful of language trauma, but also that different tribal groups have different degrees of language loss and cultural decline. And, and language is, of course, the ideal vehicle for the transmission of the culture. And language unlocks the keys to the culture. And when all the land is gone and a people are homeless in their own territories, to learn that the misappropriation of language and culture now has commercial value, it is the one last thing that they come for. And they look for value, and we have learned that there is value. And so part of the work that we do is about creating highly skilled jobs. And so capability and capacity is an important um, work stream that uh, sits alongside our data science project, our, our tribal broadcasting project. And we're one of 21 stations um, but we didn't want to just be the creators of content and the users of technology we wanted to be the developers of the technology that we used and so that's a little bit of background to the to the statement um, and yeah kia ora excellent thanks for that for that Excellent question in the, in the response, Peter Lucas. Um, do you do you have anything to that you wanted to ask? Um, no, I'm 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 grateful for your your contributions, Peter Lucas, and I'm just glad to be here and glad to meet you, Donna, and and others. Um, glad that this is happening. I think it's really cool just to be in a space where we can chat virtually and kind of bring some of the same elements of the, the in person summit um to more people so this is great excellent welcome welcome paul joining right now um just to let you know we are recording and we are streaming so if you want to uh share your camera that's fine you don't need to and you can always change your name to uh, to cover up your your identity if you like and if you have questions for for peter lucas as we talk um i'm wondering um i'm sure i, I had a conversation with a with a chap from australia who who, who was here uh, I, I know you're not from Australia. I won't make that faux pas again today. But um, he made an interesting comment as we, he went to the to the museum and saw a presentation of Maori uh, culture. And it was interesting for him to come into a different country, Mexico, and see the the mirrors of the problems we have with, with indigenous cultures all over the world. I'm, I'm Canadian. I'm from Métis background and grew up through the 1970s, where when I was a kid, it was we didn't really talk about our native heritage that I, I inherited through my mother and 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 have had an experience of discovering my roots over the years and and I find it very fascinating being someone who's lived in Mexico 30 years and comparing and contrasting uh, the situations in the country that I've adopted as opposed to the one that I left I don't know if, if you've made much thought about uh, what you've seen here in Mexico or what you've read about and what's happening here in Mexico um what I can say is that our experience 
in um, Aotearoa as Māori is very unique, um, but it's not so different that there are not similarities with the ways that other Indigenous people have been treated um, in, in the world. And I think it's important to recognise um, the role of uh, documents um, that are known internationally and the way that that has guided behaviour um, uh, historically. And, um, and, and, and that's important because we have um, Te Tiriti or Waitangi, the, the Treaty of Waitangi, and if we listen, um, you know, to the history, and, and we, we say um, statements like data is land, because um, our land and our rights were, were to be uh, protected, our property rights. Um, but when we look at history, um, that certainly wasn't the case. Those promises were breached. And they were breached for many reasons. Um, and it was perhaps the way that um, uh, those people responsible for those uh, colonizing activities viewed our tr tribal groups. And we know that they viewed our tribal groups differently. Um, and, 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 and that there were reasons why. <coughs> Excuse me. But as part of the assimilation process, land alienation and land privatization is a big thing. And uh, if we look at language and culture, um, alienating people from language and culture is a big part of disestablishing the systems and the, the powers and the, the uh, autonomy of those indigenous people in their own lands. So, so the work that we do is very much connected to the reality that we are dealing with systems of power, uh, systems of power that were, are established to exclude us in our own tribal territories, in our own country. So I think it's important to recognize that element of the work that we do. Um, in recognizing that that's a thing, <clears throat> It is important for us as uh, broadcasters, as industry leaders in our own right, in the area that we work in, to see what affirmative action in recruitment for Māori people, for Pacific Island people can mean um, when we start to design a preferred future. And, and that's because whilst open source and the philosophy is, is, is a wonderful philosophy, when I walk down the street in Kaitaia and I look around, I wonder how many of my people have the education afforded to them to make use of those open source tools. And so the context that we make decisions in is very much linked to our past experiences because our vision for a preferred future is one where we can uplift the well being of our people as well. Maori people die 10 years younger than non Maori in New Zealand. Um, we are 17% of the total population. Yet our women are the most incarcerated indigenous women in the world. Um, fifty percent or over fifty percent of the jail population uh, is Maori men. When we look at all those sorts of statistics and we think about data, data's always been used to represent the, I guess, a different story. Uh, when our name or our uh, the name of our tribes or the name of our indigenous people uh, uh, is is used, particularly in times like this, we have the election, 
our national election um, <clears throat> happening in New Zealand at the moment. And so we hear a lot of statistics being thrown around. But what we wanted to do was provide a window for people to look at the terminology differently. And so when we talk about teaching computers how to speak Māori, we're talking about restoring native sound. We're talking about restoring the language of our people to the mouths of our people. New Zealand government has an ambitious goal of having one million Māori language speakers by 2040. I say that's ambitious because there's only 500,000 Māori people. And when we think about language, language is the carrier of the culture. It connects us with our identity. When people have a stronger sense of identity, it has a lot of important and wonderful ways of improving uh, our lots um, that we deal with uh, 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 and for our families. So I wanna mention that because we don't think about the work that we do in alienation from the experiences of our families. And we wanna play in a role in contributing to um, better lives for people. And, and so I wanna mention that because there was the doctrine of discovery. And earlier in my little TED talk, I talked about um, papal documents. And for those that are interested in the rights of indigenous people, and so much as land and data is concerned, I think it's important to learn what the uh, doctrine of discovery was and how it was used to uh, assimilate, but also take over places that were not run by white Christians. And, um, and it's important part of our learning for our staff um, to recognize how we got to where we got to, because we didn't just arrive here. Um, the, the tribal groups that I come from um, have maintained their language. So we have over 47 marae in our area. Now for those people that don't know what a marae is, um, it is a, a place where uh, people gather, where tribal meetings are held. Um, there may be a, a meeting house there, a carved meeting house, a place to express hospitality. But it's an unbroken institution. And when I say institution, it has history that dates back many, many generations. And it's where all our big decision making um, by way of consensus um, and through the leadership of our elders happens. And those are places that uh, we understand to preserve our values and principles and be a place for us to reconnect because many um, families have become disconnected as they learned um, that survival is so important. But we don't want to just survive, we want to thrive. And so that is part of um, our view um, when we're doing our data science. No, thank, thank you so much, Peter. So eloquent, um, Peter Lucas Jones, joining us today, uh, one of our first virtually connecting sessions in many years. And uh, it was a privilege to meet you yesterday in person and to join us uh, for this coffee session today. I hope this is really useful to the Creative Commons community. Uh, I, the last time I worked with the Creative Commons community was four years ago from the Lisbon event when I was a virtual buddy. Uh, my colleague AK is here. He's also involved in virtually connecting. And we're so happy to have you join us in this format. And I hope this was useful for the Creative Commons community to have this uh, different way of, of viewing the conference from afar. We have another session um, tomorrow. You can check out the information about the session, same time, 9.30. And um, again, thank you so much for joining us and, and the others who joined us as well here over Zoom. And I hope this was a valuable contribution to the CC community. And, and I look forward to uh, seeing you later today, Peter uh, Lucas. And I know you're getting ready for your talk. And so I wanna really respect your time and give you some time to make it up here to the event.
Oh, no, that's absolutely perfect. It's been an absolute um, wonderful opportunity. And I just want to close by saying data sovereignty is so important. Data sovereignty is so important. And we must maintain sovereignty and guardianship over the platforms and data um, that we are responsible for. And remember that we must create opportunity in what we do. So I would like to thank you all uh, for the opportunity to be here and to share with you um, some ideas and the stories of our teaching computers, how to speak Māori. Kia ora. No, thank you. And thank you for being uh, open to this different type of experience for uh, connecting with everyone online. Thank you so much. And uh, I will sign off with that. I'm going to stop the recording here.